everyone. Welcome to Rooted Fellowship uh, Digital. Uh, if you are watching this or listening to this, uh, it means that you are not with us in person today. Uh, we have prayed over uh, this time uh, that you will get to experience with us. Uh, we've asked the Lord to do something incredible, um, and we know that He will because He is faithful. Uh, my name is Onem Makatle. If uh, you don't know me or if we have not met before, I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship. Uh, we like to say uh, that we're about three things. Uh, we're gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. Um, and if you decide to stay with us and journey with us as we seek to know more of our Father God who is seated on His throne through His Son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us, um, by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you choose to do that, uh, our hope is that you would get to experience uh, a little bit more of who we are and what we mean when we say gospel-centered disciple-making and transcultural. Now, if you're a regular, hey, welcome back. It's good to have you. It's good to see you. And again, I long for the day uh, that we would see one another face to face. Uh, if you've been tracking with us uh, these last couple of weeks, months, maybe even years, um, we want to encourage you uh, to send your prayer requests to us. Uh, we want to be praying for you, for all the things that you're going through, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, we want to lift them up to our Father who hears us, who knows what we are going through and engages us uh, in our personal spaces. We also say at Rooted that we're a giving community. Um, and so uh, if uh, you are part of the Rooted Fellowship family and, uh, and you don't give, uh, we want you to prayerfully consider to do so. Um, we give because we have received from God the greatest gift ever. Um, and when we give, we're actually communicating that, that, hey, we're giving of our time and our talents and our treasures um, because uh, we have received so much from our Father in heaven. It's an act of obedience. Uh, it's us worshiping Him who is seated on the throne and saying that you are in control of everything uh, even our resources. And so uh, jump on our website. Uh, our banking details are there. There's uh, more information about the various ways and to give and what we believe about that. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to folks who uh, give, but then also give generously. Um, we're so thankful for you. Uh, we continue to pray uh, that God would uh, provide for you in many ways, uh, that you would experience all of his joy and goodness. Um, and so yeah, uh, I hope to see you guys face to face soon. Um, enjoy uh, this message um, and I pray that it warms your heart and it reminds you uh, of Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. Enjoy. So uh, welcome to everyone who's joining uh, Rooted for uh, the first time. It's a great privilege uh, to have you uh, with us digitally. Um, we long for the day uh, where we would no longer be in a pandemic and we can gather safely. Uh, we are doing that and so um, if you are kind of jumping on this for the first time and wondering, uh, have we started meeting in person? We have, and so we'd absolutely love uh, for you to come and join us if you can, uh, if you are able. Uh, we practice the safest uh, protocols that you can imagine. Uh, I can uh, bet you uh, all the money that you have in your bank account that uh, gathering with us is safer than the braai that you recently went to. Um, and so, so please come through. Uh, we have just uh, come out of Easter Sunday, um, and uh, we were kind of in the book of Mark uh, for, for Easter Sunday, uh, but we're jumping back into the book of Mark. So we've been in the book of Mark for the last year and a bit. Uh, we are in season three, so we're wrapping up the book of Mark. It's been an absolutely incredible journey, um, and, and so uh, we're kind of going back in uh, today. Uh, we're kind of going back and then going, uh, going to move forward. It's kind of weird, but it'll make sense uh, today. But it'll, it'll make sense if you actually tune in to what we've been doing. I'm excited uh, today for two reasons. Uh, well, I'm excited for a lot of things. Um, I'm going to give you two of those things, because uh, that kind of makes me look like I'm only excited for two things. But I'm excited, um, two reasons why I'm excited. One is just the opportunity to open up God's Word uh, is, is, a, is a massive privilege. Um, it really is, and, and I'm excited to do that. I'm always excited to do that. I recognize God's grace uh, every time I do it. The fact that we live in the country that we live in, in the context that we live in, that we don't do this in secret, 
uh, is, a, is a tremendous act of grace on God's part. But it, it doesn't uh, take away uh, or it doesn't mean that God is not working in places where they have to do this in secret. In fact, we pray for our brothers and sisters in those particular contexts. Um, but they too open up God's word with great excitement. And so I'm excited for that reason. Uh, but the second reason I'm excited is, um, is I'm going to preach on the resurrection. Um, and that's exciting because we've just come out of Easter Sunday. Uh, we've just kind of taken a time to celebrate our risen king. Um, and so in us kind of taking a step back, going backwards, uh, it really puts us in a unique position, a uh, very, very unique position in that we know that Jesus has risen from the grave, that the tomb is empty, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and that has massive implications for us. Uh, and so we'll see a little bit uh, of those implications today um, as Jesus is engaging a, a group of people. All right, so we're going back uh, into Holy Week. Uh, it's now Tuesday, all right? So Jesus has been interacting with a number of people. Um, he did so on Monday, and it's now Tuesday, and so he's interacting with another group of people. In fact, uh, these people are trying to trick Jesus. That's what's happening here. Um, and if you uh, read the scriptures, the, the Gospels, uh, you'll see that anybody who tries to trick Jesus, it never really ends well for them. Um, and so we're going to see that uh, again in the text today. They're trying to trick Jesus. And so if you have a Bible, uh, you can meet me in Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 18 to 27 is where we'll be. And we're just literally going to walk through it and unpack uh, all these golden nuggets that we find here. Uh, today's going to feel a little bit like in the beginning, uh, we're, we're really just mining, right? We're, we're, we're digging. Uh, we're, we're trying to get to those golden nuggets, but there's some things that we need to do first. We need to lay the ground uh, foundation, if you will, uh, so that we might understand uh, what it is that Jesus is saying here and what that means for our lives. And so let me uh, set the scene. Remember, there's a group of people uh, who are asking Jesus a question. They're trying to trick him. Uh, so let's start with the first question. Uh, what is the question? Right? W what is the question that they are asking Jesus? And so uh, let's read from verse 18 uh, of our passage today. It says, The Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and questioned him. Teacher, Moses wrote... For us, that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife behind but no child, that man should take the wife and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married a woman and dying left no offspring. The second also took her and he died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. None of the seven left offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. In the resurrection, when they rise... Whose wife will she be since the seven had married her? Now, uh, what they're referring to here uh, comes from the Old Testament. Uh, this law uh, that they're referring to, the one in question, actually comes from uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 25, verses 5 to 6, to be specific. Um, and so this explicit, uh, the explicit purpose of this law, this commandment in Deuteronomy, uh, was to have the surviving brother produce an heir to allow the name of his dead brother to go on so that it would not be blotted out of Israel as the text says. That, that was the purpose of this commandment. The, the literal meaning of the biblical text implies uh, that the firstborn child uh, of uh, this man uh, would be named after the dead brother. This is now the woman who's now uh, married the brother of the older one who has died. Uh, this was to carry on his memory, all right? Uh, however, this is true only in the spiritual sense, uh, for there was no requirement uh, to name the newborn son after the dead brother, all right? So this was just uh, for the spiritual sense and that, hey, uh, uh, let the legacy continue if you will. The duty of this marriage was required only on one who was alive at the time of the death, at the time of death of his childless brother. All right, so it did not apply to one born after his brother's death. Furthermore, both brothers must have the same father. So it's quite detailed here. Uh, if either of these conditions uh, were not fulfilled, then the childless widow was immediately free to marry anyone of her choosing. Now. 
one of the questions that came up for me as I was making my way through this text was how does this benefit the woman? Right? So I understand for, for the man, but how does this benefit the woman? Taking into account uh, the time and the context in which this was written. Right? So we cannot separate what was going on uh, from what had been written. And so how does this benefit the woman? The institution of this marriage also served to protect the wife. See, in numerous verses uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, we're told that widows, orphans, and strangers were often disenfranchised members of society to whom special kindness must be shown. The situation of a widow without children was especially dire. For she had no one to care for her or to provide for her materially. And so this particular law guaranteed her a new family, enhanced status, financial resources. Uh, the, fa the most famous story about this kind of marriage in the Bible is that of Tamar, who was an ancestor of King David. And you can find the story in Genesis 38. And, and so there was great benefit uh, for the women because of the context and the times and the culture in which they lived. And, and so let me summarize the question. They show up to Jesus and they say, okay, here's this woman. She gets married, no children, her husband dies, then marries the brother, no children, husband dies, and so on and so on until there's no more. And so now that we have some context regarding the question, uh, the next question that we should ask is, who's asking it? So we have the question, now who, who's asking it? The Sadducees, verse 18 tells us, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and questioned him. See, the Sadducees were the upper class of the Jewish community. They were considered the priestly group, influential in the temple and in the Sanhedrin. Uh, now, a Sanhedrin is a, a council, uh, much like a, a court, if you will. It's where decisions are made. When you hear the word Sanhedrin, uh, you might remember the council that unlawfully judged Jesus and decided to hand him over to the Roman authorities for execution. It's those guys. The Sadducees were, were, were part of that group. Scripture tells us that they got their name from the high priest Zadok. Uh, since the sons of Zadok were the worthiest to minister in, uh, to the Lord in the temple. That's who the Sadducees were. That's where they came from. Uh, not only were they wealthy, but they were also politically connected. They considered themselves as the conservative priestly group. Uh, they held to older doctrines and teachings. Uh, they always opposed the Pharisees, both politically and religiously. And while although both groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both believed in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, those written by Moses, is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they both believed in them. The Pharisees also accepted what was called the oral law, while the Sadducees refused to accept anything that was not written in the Torah. The Sadducees, have been historically represented as uh, worldly-minded nobles, primarily interested in maintaining their own privileged position. That's who they were. Now, let's take a closer look at what they believed. Right? So we, we kind of have an understanding of who they were, but, but let's unpack, let's dig a little bit more uh, so that we might see what they believed. It's important so that we can understand how Jesus responds to them. So a couple things. Like I mentioned earlier, the, Sad the Sadducees believed in the first five books of Moses, what is known as the Torah. Uh, they only believed in those, nothing else. They believed that these books and these books alone were the only authority on matters of faith and life. Sadducees flatly rejected the Pharisee teaching that 
oral tradition was equal to scripture in authority. So, so if someone came with an interpretation or a teaching or a commentary on uh, the first five books of uh, the Bible, they would just say, nope, not going to listen to that at all. They would probably say, if I don't see it written, I don't believe it. That's number one. Number two, they believed in complete free will, meaning God had no role in the personal lives of people, that everyone was the master of his or her destiny. God simply stood back and watched. That's what they believed, complete free will. Number three, Sadducees entirely rejected the supernatural. They just didn't believe it. They rejected the supernatural, opposing belief in angels, demons, miracles, heaven, hell, and the resurrection. To their way of thinking, souls die with the body. And that's the end. That's it. Once you're in the ground, it's game over. Number four, even though they didn't believe in the resurrection, they believed strongly in ceremonial purity, uh, that which uh, was given to them by Moses. Moses wrote quite a bit uh, in the first five books of the Bible on ceremonial purity. And they believed it. But, but why? The question is why? Well, it's because they didn't want anything to disqualify them from leading the temple services that generated income. They, they didn't want that. They, they didn't want to be disqualified from that. So they were like, look, look, we'll believe in that. We'll pick and choose so that we might continue to benefit, to maintain our status. Remember, wealth and the accumulation of it seems to have been the number one belief of the Sadducees. Maybe as many would say today, they protected the bag. No? You guys don't say that? No? Okay. Modern archaeologists have uncovered a few ancient Sadducee homes, describing them as the most luxurious discovered to date in Jerusalem. They're just blown away by, by what they have uncovered. So these, these were real people. Not just spoken of in the Bible, but they were, they were real people. But let's stay in the text. All right, so we know who they are and we know what they believe. Let's, let's stay in the text. Let's go back to what's going on here. We're told by Mark in his introduction of this encounter between Jesus and the Sadducees that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. This was not Jesus' first encounter with the Sadducees. Actually, the day before, Jesus had rolled into the temple, the temple that the Sadducees oversaw, remember that? And was, well, let's let Mark tell the story. So Mark 11, from verses 15 to 18, here's the encounter of Jesus' uh, kind of engagement with what was going on in the temple, and the Sadducees were present. It says, when they arrived Back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables. Other translations say he overturned the tables. Right? So he knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare... My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. He, he's, he's drawing from Isaiah 56 verse 7 when he says that. My temple will not be called a house of prayer, or my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. What's Jesus doing here? He's protesting. Hashtag Jesus protested. As he draws from Isaiah 56 verse 7, 
where we're told that, that God has always had all nations on his heart. He's always had them in mind. That hashtag Gentile lives matter. That's what's happening here. Now I know for some of you it's probably blowing your mind. Hold on, on it. What? Jesus protested? I wish I could say more, but that's not what I'm preaching about today. I just want you to see it in the text. But I am expecting your email, um, and so you can email me at jono at rootedfellowship.com. Can't wait to read them. Why, why, what did Jesus, uh, what led to, or what happened, rather, what happened after Jesus protested in the temple? Um, it says, when the leading priests, that's the Sadducees, when the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed by his teaching. And so fast forward, right, fast forward the next day, they show up to him. We're told by Mark in his introduction of this encounter, Mark chapter 12, between Jesus and the Sadducees, that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So, so let's break this down. See, the Sadducees were questioning Jesus, seeking to lure him into a trap. This was no honest seeking question. They were questioning Jesus about the very thing they didn't believe in. Let's, let's slow this thing down a little bit. I think sometimes we read too quickly over the scriptures. So they're, they're questioning Jesus about the very thing that they don't believe in. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where you are being questioned about your faith by someone who doesn't believe. So they're, they're qu- trying to trap you. I can imagine them smiling at one another thinking, oh, we we got him. We got him now. See, this was a question that the Sadducees probably always asked the Pharisees and left them stumped. So in their minds, they're like, okay, cool. Hey, nudging one another, ask him, ask him. You know what? Add, Add another husband, add another brother, add another brother. Let's see how he's going to answer this. But can I say this? If, if I was in the crowd, um, I, I'd probably be the person who'd lift up my hand and go, hey, hey Sadducees, um, great question, uh, but is, has anyone, uh, is anyone investigating this woman? I mean, like, you'd think by the third brother, someone's going, hey, guys, uh, what's going on? I'm sure the, the fourth brother was always getting takeouts. He was just like, nope, not today. I am not touching that food. But, uh, but maybe that's just me. So They're trying to trick Jesus. They say, uh, let's pick it up from verse 22, none of the seven left offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be since the seven had married her. Now I want us to look at how Jesus responds. All right? We've done a lot of digging and uncovering. We've, we understand the context, right? But, but, but I want us to notice how Jesus responds. It's important for what we see here. And it's important because this is how Jesus' disciples should respond. This is how Jesus' disciples should respond in situations like this. This is why it's important. And so look at what he says. Jesus spoke to them. Isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? Other translations say, isn't this the reason why you are in error? You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Of God. In fact, at the end of his engagement, he then says to them, You are badly mistaken. In case you missed it, you are badly mistaken. Let's take a look at Jesus' reason for calling them out on their error, which is also important for us because we find ourselves making this mistake as well. 
before we quickly judge the Sadducees, we should also hold up the scriptures like a mirror and go, hey, do I make this mistake? So the first reason, he says, you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the scriptures. Here is why this is important. Jesus responds to their question with the scriptures. He uses the Bible. If we were to comb through the four Gospels and take a look at Jesus' encounter with his disciples or with those who disagree with him, whenever he came across a trying and challenging time, he would respond from the knowledge of the scriptures. Remember Jesus in the desert? Before beginning his ministry, he's fasting and praying. Satan shows up and he says to him, hey, I know you're hungry, turn those stones to bread. Where does Jesus go? To Deuteronomy chapter 8. He's like, no, no, I know what you're trying to do. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 where it says that, that God led uh, his people out into the wilderness and then humbled them and tested them. They were hungry. And so manna fell from the heavens. And it was there where he said to them, I want you to know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He uses scripture. But here, in this particular context, Jesus goes to Exodus to show them how mistaken they are. He reveals to them how mistaken they are when he says in verse 26, and as for the dead being raised, haven't you read in the book of Moses? Remember, they believe in the first five books of the Bible. Those written by Moses. And so he, he goes there. He says, in the passage about the burning bush, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, who is he talking about right now? It's Moses. Right? It's Moses in the burning bush where God comes and speaks to him. How God said to him, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus is pointing them to the burning bush with Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where it says, I'm going to read from verse 5. It says, God is saying to, to, to Moses, do not come any closer. Already, it's kind of their, their, uh, a meeting place, if you will. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. See, Jesus chooses the texts, the scriptures, the, the passages that the Sadducees would accept as authoritative. That's where he goes. He's revealing to them that the very Bible they say they believe in they actually don't. Think about it. Jesus is making these logical, biblical, truthful points. Here's what he's saying. He says, God says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. But God is the God of the living. He doesn't say, I was the God of. I am living, implying also that they too are living. Now, now it's important to know this, a little bit of kind of history here, is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had long died when Moses showed up. So they're long gone, but yet God is speaking to them in the present, implying that they are very much alive. very much alive, therefore there is a resurrection. He's saying, guys, you've been reading this for years. How? How have you missed it? Why is this important for us? Well, if we say we are Christians, which means we follow Jesus, 
We say what he says and do what he does. That's what it means to be a disciple. It's to say what he says and to do what he does. Then likewise, we should respond from the knowledge of the scriptures. If Jesus uses scripture to answer tests, criticism, and challenges, then so should we. If it's good enough for Jesus, friends, it's good enough for us. We should know the scriptures. We should know the Bible. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 2, it says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. We should know the scriptures. Psalm 119, verses 11 to 16. The psalmist writes, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. When was the last time you recited all the regulations, all of God's word? I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. There's a good one. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Know the scriptures. Be this way. Be like Jesus. Know the word of God so that when things come up to us, we can respond with ease and with quickness, with truth and with grace. We should be skilled in the word, knowing how to use it in our lives and in the lives of others. Do, do, do you know why sometimes, and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be real honest, sometimes I end up giving people my own personal advice. It's because I am not in the scriptures and so therefore I create a God of my imagination instead of a God of revelation. We should know how to use the scriptures. We should use them like a hammer in some situations, ready to knock down the gates of hell. Or like a surgical knife cutting out very delicately the sin and darkness in the lives of people. We should know how to use the word of God. Knowing God means obeying his word too. This means walking with him daily, daily, trusting him in all circumstances. That We should live according to his word, that we should surrender ourselves to him. This is the key to knowing God deeply. It's to find ourselves in here. God has made himself accessible to us. Know the scriptures. But how? How can my life be this way? In the way that the psalmist speaks, where I have hidden God's word in my heart. How? How do I do this? Well, by sitting in the word. Guys, I, I wish I had something else for you. But it's by sitting in the word, by marinating in it, by pouring it over your heart and your mind over and over and over again. Uh, let me explain it this way. Um, I consider myself a pretty good cook. <clears throat> Oh, okay, no, no objections. <laughs> I consider myself a pretty good cook, and I, and I particularly enjoy cooking things where um, I just kind of add all the ingredients together and then just let it sit there. Kind of slow cook whatever it is I'm preparing. I love it. Uh, one of my favorite meals to make for my family is oxtail. Oxtail needs time. 
It's Tom. You know, you cut up all the vegetables, you get all the spices together, you've got to braise the meat. I know there's a lot of guys out there going, what? You can Google it. <laughs> put everything together, put it on a low temperature, and then just let it cook. See, if you do it right, you don't have to be inside the house yet. You can have pulled up and parked and go, something's cooking. I can smell it already. If you do it right, when, when you're eating that oxtail, it literally, literally falls off the bone. It melts in your mouth. Friends, I'm telling you this because this is how the word of God should be in our lives. That, that people should smell us coming. We're so in the word that they're like, you know what? They are the people of God. And then when they show up, it's just like Jesus literally just, just falls off us into their lives. And so if that not is happening, it begs the question, are we in the word of God? You don't know the scriptures, Jesus says. But let's go to the second reason that they are in error. He says, you don't know the power of God. See, Jesus now talks about the purpose of marriage, heaven, and ties in the resurrection to reveal their lack of understanding of God's power. Sounds a bit weird. <laughs> That's what Jesus does. There's a saying out there that if you want to build a big crowd, teach on sex or the end times. If you want to build a really big crowd, teach sex in the end times. Jesus kind of brings it all together. But let's take a look at what Jesus actually says. Verse 25. He says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. See, when talking about heaven, it's difficult to fully capture it in explanation because the Bible doesn't actually give us exact details of what it's like. A lot of people will ask, hey, are we going to work? Is there going to be public holidays? You know, what's the vibe? The Bible doesn't give us those details. But we do know the big stuff, the stuff I believe God wanted us to know. We know that we will have glorified bodies. We know that we will rule and govern with Jesus, Revelation 3.21. We know that we will no longer sin or suffer. We know that God will satisfy us with his presence forever. We know that we will worship and serve God forever. We know that we will be with a multitude of other believers. We know that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So then, what about relationships? Particularly marriage. How does that then fit into all of this? See, the Bible tells us that we will continue to enjoy our earthly relationships with believers in heaven. But the exact nature of those relationships will be transformed in some way. The Bible is clear on that. Why? Why will they be transformed in some way? Well, because the resurrected life is more than a mere continuation of this life. It's more than that. The, the resurrected life is different from the world we live in. While there'll be some continuity that, you know, we will be ourselves, you'll see me coming around the corner and you'll be like, oh, there's on air. There will be some things that won't continue. Like us decaying, and getting older, and getting frail, and going blind. That won't continue. See, the Pharisees... This is the other group of people that try to trick Jesus a number of times. The Pharisees taught that the afterlife was a, a kind of 2.0 version of this life. That it was just a, a, a simple upgrade. You know, like when you upgrade your uh, iPhone. I know some people upgrade Androids. I'm not 100% sure what that even means. <laughs> um, but when you upgrade the iPhone, it's just a simple upgrade. It's a slight change. That's what the Pharisees taught. But that's not the case. We're told that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, 
Revelation 21 verses 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. The resurrected life is not a prolonged earthly life, but life in an entirely new dimension. Can we wrap our minds around that? But I'd like to flesh this out a little bit. This no marriage in heaven. Um, because I'm pretty sure if you are married, and happily so, you're, you're going, oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, what do you mean that I'm not going to spend the rest of my life throughout eternity? Mar- what, I, I enjoy my marriage. So let me flesh this out a little bit. See, marriage on earth has a purpose. It has its reasons. It uh, fulfills four needs, right? I've kind of summarized it to, to four needs, four needs that marriage fulfills. Number one, companionship. Companionship. For those who are married, my hope is that you would look to your spouse and say, you are my best friend. Companionship. Well, number two, it fulfills procreation. This is how babies are made. Yes, I know, I know, I know you might go, but oh no, no, it's, it's, it happens through sex. Yes, but according to God, it's in the context of marriage. So procreation. Number three, sexual joy. Let that one sit for a moment. Yes, Oni did say sexual joy. That we're meant to enjoy sex. God gave it to us so that we might enjoy it, that we might fight great intimacy with this person that we love. And then number four, the most important reason that we're given earthly marriage is that it's a picture of the gospel. It's one of the clearest pictures of the gospel. It's, it's what we call a covenant. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 5 and you'll read all about it. A covenant, a promise. It's this picture that displays the ultimate marriage between Jesus and the church. Jesus being the groom and the church being the bride. This is why earthly marriage is so important that that we should come to the scriptures and go, how am I supposed to do this? God, how do I honor you in my marriage? Because people, when they look and see your marriage, Ephesians 5 tells us that they should be able to see a trailer attraction of what is to come. The ultimate marriage. It's a covenant. And so in the resurrected life, the first three reasons, companionship, procreation, sexual joy, in the resurrected life, these three needs are fully met. And the fourth reason, the fourth purpose, will be completely fulfilled in the completion of the restored kingdom of God. Jesus says he's coming back for his bride. And then there's going to be this epic marriage between Jesus and the church. Friends, marriage is beautiful. I know when we look to society, even when we look in the church, it doesn't feel that way. A friend of mine uh, said this to me. He said, you know, the reason that we as the church, we come up and we go, marriage is amazing and marriage is beautiful and, and, and God instituted it, it's great. The reason why the world looks to the church and goes, mm, I don't believe you, is because so many of us don't treat it like covenant. We just kind of walk away when we want to. I mean, the stats are horrendous on the divorce rates, particularly in the church. I mean, imagine if an airline said, hey, you know, hey guys, we'd love for you to fly with us, but only 50% of our flights make it. How many of us would be going, how do I get my tickets? How do I? would be like, you know, it's okay, I think I'll drive. It's a covenant, and it's beautiful. Marriage is beautiful. It's created and ordained by God, but it is a temporary institution. I hate to break it to you, but it is a temporary institution. 
See, there will be no more reproduction in our resurrected life. There will be no need for marital companionship because that, that will change. There will be no lonely people in heaven. God will satisfy us with himself forever. Even the pleasure of sex will not be something we long for. The pleasure of sex will be something we uh, no longer want. And that's because no one will be disappointed in heaven. No one will say, I wish I was married in heaven. No, you won't. You won't. And, and, and maybe this might serve as a word of encouragement uh, to those who are single. That there is coming something one day where you'll go, you know what, all I need is here. No one will say, I wish for anything in heaven. I mean, you can think about your greatest longing, whatever it is that you desire right now. Maybe it's for kids, maybe it's for companionship, maybe it's for sex. All of those desires will be gone. It will be focused and centered around the one who is on the throne. All your longings and desires will be fulfilled. See, I believe Jesus here is making the point that our thinking of heaven is too small. Our thinking of heaven is way too small. Our small-minded thinking about it reveals that we aren't sufficiently considering the power of God as we ought to. That he who spoke everything into existence has a plan for us and he's saying, hey guys, it's going to be better than that which I created in the beginning. God is going to blow our minds. Whatever you think of heaven, you don't know the half of it. Jesus says, your vision of heaven is too earthly. That's the problem. Your vision of heaven is too earthly. And so Jesus is unmistakably saying, there is a resurrection. And he's, he's being the greatest power of God on display. He's very resurrection. He could have simply said to the Sadducees, oh, you guys don't believe in the resurrection? Uh, just hold on. Just so wait a couple days. Sunday is coming. He could have said that to them. I mean, at this point, he had already predicted his resurrection three times. There is a resurrection. He's unmistakably saying that there will be no marriage relationship exactly as we know it in this life. Because everything that we find in our earthly marriages, we will have in our heavenly groom. And then he says that we will be like angels. We will be like angels. Now, now what does this mean? Uh, let me say what it doesn't. Uh, we will not be like those cartoons that you used to watch uh, with the wings and the halos. No, no, that's not what he's saying. We will be able to recognize one another in the same way that Jesus was recognizable through his glorified body after his resurrection. And so it doesn't mean that we will become angels. I mean, he uses the word here, like. Not become, but like. We will be like angels. Remembering that we are different from angels. We are made in the image of God. We will be like angels. Which means... But like angels, we will no longer marry. Angels don't get married. We will no longer procreate. They don't procreate. We will never die. It means we will be in glorious harmony with God. It means that we will have no feeling of discontentment or disappointment. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more darkness. Every day, just constant satisfaction found in Jesus in all its fullness. I mean, how amazing is all of this? 
and the fact that all of this is, is, is promised in the word of God. It's all here, and then it's made possible by the power of God. Like, it blows my mind. It blows my mind that every time I open up the scriptures, I'm reminded of the endless promises that God makes to us that are fulfilled in Jesus. That The power of God is right here. Right here at our fingertips. And yet we run to all these temporary things hoping that they will give us that which only God can. And so my question that I ask every week is will you believe? Will you believe? Will you believe in the scriptures? Will you believe in the power of God? Will you believe that God sent his son to come and live the life that you and I should have lived but couldn't? Will you believe that he died the death that you and I deserved? Will you believe that he quenched the wrath of God? Will you believe that that he reconciled us back to the Father? It's all in the scriptures. Will you surrender your life to him? Now I know, I know that there's great tension here. I know some of you might go, well, okay, I believe. I believe in the word of God. I believe in the power of God, but I find myself in between here where it's like, but I'm still in the same situation. I believe in the word of God and I believe in the power of God and yet things are not changing. What then? Well, friends, let's go to the word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 15 tells us that we do not serve a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And yet was tempted, like us, in every single way, and yet did not sin. Uh, Let's slow that down. It means that Jesus is aware of what you are going through. He's not disconnected from this tension that you are living in. That while we are in this temporary world, in this temporary brokenness, temporary darkness, Jesus understands and he's right there with you. And he can get you through it. Because he's the only one that was in the same place that you are in now and yet did not sin. And so you can trust in him. We could also go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where, where, where Paul is going, man, there's this thorn in my flesh and, oh, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and nothing. What does he then say? In my weakness I found your power. He says, your grace is sufficient. That while my circumstances don't change, my heart is anchored in you. And your grace is enough to get me through it. And it's temporary. In light of eternity, our view of heaven is so small. Our view of heaven is so small. The Lord would give me another 35, 40, 50 years. That's nothing in comparison to eternity. And so I'm going to limp for the next 40 years, but for eternity, I'm going to run like Usain Bolt, maybe even, okay, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll take the 40 years of limping. Knowing that he is with me every step of the way. When I go into the fire, when I'm in the fire, and when I'm out of the fire, it's the power of God that sustains me. His grace is sufficient. And so let me close with these words. It's the words of Jesus found in John chapter 11. Verses 25, he he says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. I am the resurrection and the life. The life. See, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, he was claiming to be the source of both. There is no resurrection apart from Christ, and there is no eternal life apart from Christ. You can't separate the two. And beyond that, Jesus was also making a statement concerning his divine nature. He does more than give life, he is life. 
and therefore death has no ultimate power over him. Jesus gives this spiritual life on those who believe in him. So they too will share in his victory. His victory over death. And so, friends, I think we need to be a church that believes in a big and powerful and mighty God. We have to be. And we have to be a church who has worn out Bibles. Because we are nose deep in the scriptures. And holding on to the fact that God is powerful and willing to live in the tension. My hope is that the evil one would not take us to a place where we no longer trust in the one who is seated on the throne, who has done it all, who loves us more than we could ever imagine. And so I ask again, will you believe? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we come to him for life. And so, Father, we we pray. We pray asking that these ancient words would be made fresh in our hearts today. That many of us are struggling to believe that, God, you are powerful. Because we look at our situations, our struggles, our challenges... And we wonder, God, are you able? Father, I pray that we would run to the scriptures. Holy Spirit, would you cause us to move towards the scriptures where we would believe again, we would trust again, that as we read the scriptures, as we pour them over our hearts and our minds, that transformation is happening. That we would hold on to the hope that we confess. Father, help us to hide your word in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. Father, help us to praise you as you teach us your word. Father, make us a people who love to say God's word over and over and over again, not only privately, but publicly as well. Father, help us to rejoice in your commandments. Help us to be those who diligently study the word because they reveal Jesus who points us to the Father. Help us to delight in your word, to meditate on it day and night. Father God, I pray that your word would light the way that your word would reveal the darkness in our hearts, that your word would remind us that you are kind, slow to anger, merciful, full of grace. That for those who surrender their lives to Jesus, we are your children. Father, we sit at your table and that you meet us where we are. So do so yet again. Would you save many? Would you encourage many? Until that day you return, Jesus, make us a people of your word who believe in the power of an almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.